There can be only one. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. All out of bubblegum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. Good Monday evening. This is Cinema Royale on Monday nights. Just kidding. This is a special occasion because it's Muppet Monday. I'm your host, Mike Mixtape, and I'm going to introduce you to my fellow Cinema Royale co-hosts. First up, we got James Sullivan, also known as Hymitude. Tonight's broadcast is brought to you by way of Ariel Body Slamming and Caprio located into a hooker's bunghole. Bunghole? Bunghole. Bunghole. Well, we come up with many bungholes. <laughs> Did somebody watch Wolf of Wall Street today? <laughs> no, but someone watched it over the weekend and told me all about it. Uh, well, not today. Oh, boy. <laughs> Let's not forget about Matt Brunet, also known as Anima. Hello, everybody. I might be a little bit sick, but I'm still able to do the podcast. Me too, apparently. Me three. <laughs> oh. And last but not least, I would say he's a Muppet maniac. He's Morgan Ledger. Is he's rounding out the petri dish. Uh, I was gonna start off with a bad impersonation of Kermit, but seeing how I already gave myself away, I'll just uh, skip to the point where I just say, "Hi ho, Morgan Ledger here, and what you're listening to is the world's worst Steve Whitmer impersonation you'll hear in your life." Yay! Yep, 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 Greetings. Oh. 2.9 cents a month. 2.9 oh. cents. Oh. Greetings, greetings. Hi there. Cow, cow, Shut up. <laughs> Let's get on with this. <laughs> I'm just seeing how long that's going to take before you guys break it. <laughs> um, everyone who's Ooh, listening... Muppets. Everyone who's listening should be able to know who the Muppets are. We're not going to give you the whole spiel of the history of it. There's a lot of TV shows that came out before the official debut of the Muppets on the big screen. Let's start out with the obvious one, the first one, known as the Muppet movie that came out on June 22nd, 1979. In, in terms of the chains, Jim always wanted to do a feature film from the start. He did um, a couple of short films on the side, minus the Muppets, because he saw puppetry as a side hobby. Um, he did the short film Timepiece, uh, a couple of TV movies like The Cube and U68, and there were sort of experimental pieces that really showed a different side of him. But when it came to the Muppets, that was sort of very sane humor, sketch humor. And sure enough, when he did Muppet Projects, he would always focus on pushing the boundaries of breaking puppet technology. And when it came to the Muppet movie, it was the case of actually pushing um, these characters, which were more than just sock puppets, with a heart and soul, actually putting them in the real world. Like, legitimately in the real world, mm -hmm. making you believe a bear would drive a car, or a frog could do a tap dance, anything of that sort. Mm -hmm. It was always going beyond the realms of the show and just literally putting them in this own little reality that's like our own, but it's really their universe. And when you really think about puppet films of the past, they never really had that meshing of reality um, with puppets. The only one I can think of is a 1950s French film 
which was an adaptation of Alice in Wonderland, but that's really the only one I can think of at the time. And then there's the George Pal films, like Wonderful World of the Brothers Grimm, but that was um, stop motion. In the case of Puppet Puppets, this was a case of intermeshing fictional characters who were made of felt with real actors, and the blending really was successful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Like, if there is one thing that... Uh, like the the Muppet movie in a sense is a lot like film like films where it's more of a technolo- a bit of a technological in- innovation uh, more than uh, kind of like uh, how ba- how Songs of the South or uh, the Three Caballeros was back then when mixing animation with live actors with the t- even with the technology back then you definitely do believe that the the actors are interacting with the with these animated characters which are just made out of cell uh, animation cells and paint and stuff like that mm. but then when you have like the muppet movie um it, it, like you definitely do believe like sure you can believe that a puppet can be in the real world like that but um it really is something else to believe that it's just the puppet itself and like there is no actor underneath it really is the puppet coming to life and like that's what really that that's what really sparks with um with the muppet movie is that not only like you already have established characters like muppet uh, kermit uh, miss piggy fozzie bear and all that stuff but you also have the f- like now you see them like like all completely from head to toe coming to life and stuff like that and it really is um it, it's like a, a, that little piece of t- of uh, innovation that no one would really notice mm. honestly like it doesn't seem much but it, it <coughs> kind of is a lot <coughs> the other thing to point out too even when Early on, when they were doing interviews for people, what the interviewees or guest celebrities would notice is that they would pay more attention to Kermit and Miss Piggy and Fozzie being performed, and they would pay attention less to the performers. And the thing is, they would put so much life in the performance that they would be more distracted in seeing this character come to life more than just looking at the performer and saying, oh, um, Yes, you there holding the puppet. I'm going to talk to you because you're the one controlling the character. When they're really more fixed on the character. And a good example, of course, would be Rolf the Dog interacting with Jimmy Dean, which was a very, very popular um, uh, meshing of a piano playing dog and a country western singer. And it definitely mm-hmm. showed proof over time for that. So imagining that as like the whole basis of the film, but to the next extreme, is really a concept that was a bit of a gamble even for um, worrying at the time how it would work out. But considering how there was already celebrities asking to be on The Muppet Show, and considering the success of the show at the time, it was pretty much sold that people were really going to dig this film just for the sheer story, the enjoyment of the characters. And again, they're actually taking these characters and putting them out into another realm outside of the theater and actually seeing how they got together and all that sort of stuff. So it really is interesting to see how far they can push the boundaries of not just the technology, but even the characters as well. You have Gonzo going from a daredevil to someone in the desert singing about how he's going to go back there someday. It's a very interesting character change when you compare the feature films and the show combined. Because mm-hmm. here they're outside of the realm. You're actually seeing characters, not characters being funny, comical, and goofy. You you still get that in the movie, but here you actually see the character side of it. You have Fozzie struggling to be a comedic performer. You have, um, again, Gonzo trying to follow his dreams, even though they're really, really out there. there. There's always this very ingenuitive side of them, and you really, really feel very connected to them, how they want to go really out there and just entertain people. Mm-hmm. 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 Def- mo- most definitely and like you know and, and like that's one thing that you really do appreciate with uh the with the muppet movie is like is that you get to learn a lot more about about these characters it's like what you it's like what you said like we 
it's not just the characters just being goofy, but it's just the characters, like, we know a lot more than, more about them and stuff like that. Like, even now, like, even nowadays, how the Muppets are so big, like, are, are pretty much coming back to the mainstream with the recent films, mm. which we'll talk about later. It's much later. It's, it's just, it's just right now, it's like they're, they're taking these character. It's like they're taking characters that we already know, but like develop the, developing them much more. And like we and like fans of the show, and it really is great for like everyone. Fans of the show uh, will appreciate these characters a lot more, and even like newcomers will learn like will learn about like who these guys are, and then when they see the show, like they will know who they are and like what they do. Yeah, but like it really works in both ways. And another thing too, even just like the show, they have guest stars, but they're not distractions. Okay, even even from a nostalgic point of view, you can say, "Oh, hey, look, it's Mel Brooks playing a German scientist." Isn't this been an interesting twist? It's the way they interact that really does work to the extent. It's not like, "Oh, hey, John Cleese is here because he's John Cleese." It's really again how they interact with each other, and that's something they even carried over to the show as well. Um, with a never-ending line of cameos, Milton Berle, uh, no, 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 Sid Caesar's in it, sorry, who was, I think, a Bob Hope, uh, Richard Pryor at one point, believe it or not, mm-hmm. and the list goes on and on and on, yeah. even, even George Orwell, is it George or- oh, no, uh, Orwell, what's his Wells. name, Orson Welles, thank you, Orson Welles makes a really good appearance at the end, um, is the executive that hires him on, and you're not really focused on the celebrity. You're really focused on how they're interacting with these characters. Dom DeLuise in the swamp and how you can't really see the performer under the log Kermit is sitting on. It's really interesting just to see how their type of humor and vibe really gels with them. If they're playing a villain, it's interesting to see how they play against the good nature of these characters. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm on the... I had the opportunity to sit down and watch the Muppet movie for the first time uh, just for this podcast uh, with uh, with Morgan here and I'm always and I'm always, I'm always fascinated to 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 go back in time uh, so to speak and look at and look at movies like this and say um, okay uh, effects. Uh, I I'm gonna hop on the effects uh, immediately, pretty much here. Effects wise, if this were done today, I know I know exactly how they would do it. Effects wise, I'm looking at this and just trying, still trying to figure out <laughs> how stuff is done because um, because it's it's all practical and. Uh, I uh, we we had a uh, a nice uh, Morgan and I had a, a nice big debate over you know how this uh, how this one shot was done near the end of the film one shot with uh, with Kermit sitting on a stool I'm I'm just thinking well how did they do this uh, it could have been it it doesn't look like it was uh, it was an overlay. That wasn't done. That wasn't done with motion tracking during this time. And Morgan goes ahead and tells me, "Oh, it's uh, mirrors on the on the on the bottom of the on the bottom of the stool." And I'm I I would never have guessed mirrors. It's it's a bit of a stretch, but it's something I picked up from a Sesame Street sketch where Dustin Hoffman is channeling different uh, Muppet characters, um, even Elmo at one point, and if you look really close on the stool he's sitting, you can see something wobbling. And I remember distinctly looking at it and saying, it looks like some sort of plain glass or a filter. And looking at that shot again with James, even I was impressed. And I remember looking again and saying, I think that's the same trick they used. And again, that's the thing with Jim. He can always take the biggest effects and he can just sit back and say, oh, yeah, it was just simply done this. Uh, even as a kid, he, you know, pulled off the most complex thing with the most simplest of stuff. And that's something he's carried over in time as well. Mm-hmm. 
Hmm. Hmm. It definitely that definitely is interesting. Hmm. Because, like, um, as a sculptor, uh, well, when I sculpted during college, I did understand learning about like the power of simple, learn like the power of simple objects. How you can use like the most common items from styrofoam to aluminum to cardboard, and like they can be used very effectively. And it really does. And like, for how it is, it, like the way that Jim Henson would use, like, it, is it mirrors? Yes. Or, yeah, just using mirrors. It really is. Um, you know that really, it really is impressive. Hmm. Like. So yeah, pretty much just like what you guys said, a small thing can really go a long way. And the thing too that even people talk about for years, um, two things really. The first being the opening shot, which um, I remember even one of Jim's um, kids, I think it's Paul Henson, uh, was rather amazed by it, but also feared at the same time, is when you see Kermit playing the banjo on a log singing the Rainbow Connection. You have to have really really good guts to be in a position like that you have jim inside a small submarine like tank and he's all cross-legged and you know crunching like a sardine and his hand is coming through playing kermit and someone has a radio control playing the banjo and keep in mind he's underwater like legitimately underwater so imagine oh, yeah. the danger of losing him just like that and even um his son who was there seeing the filming grew very worrisome but um Jim was fearless. He's done certain productions where he had to have an apple shoot off a puppet's head or even set Frank um, Oz's hand on fire just for a coffee sketch. Um, so he's really used to those kind of things. He's always very laid back and quiet, but again, just seeing how it comes together is just amazing. Even if it's the riskier of things, he'll pull through just to get the magic in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can... De yeah. But I can imagine because I remember seeing a documentary regarding the behind the scenes of um, of uh, the Dark Crystal. A mm. lot of the a lot of the puppets, uh, a lot of the puppets, how they made them, often like they can be sometimes they can be a bit uncomfortable for the actors, or often like really dangerous to use like one little slip up and they're done for like yeah, they could break some bones and stuff like that yeah like, i remember the mystics were the hardest because they can only shoot like five minutes of material and then the actors would have to relax because how they'd be hunched over in the costumes mm -hmm. <laughs> uh again another um effect is the obvious kermit riding a bike <clears throat> ah yes yeah that 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 seems like you need some animatronics and stuff like that in order to do it. Funny, like, the... sorry. Or like at least, not not on Kermit, but maybe like the bike. Actually, it's funny you should say that because it's more simplistic than you imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, James, I to uh, cover this one, seeing that we both seen the documentary, and I've spewed too much jargon about the behind the scenes material. Hmm. Well. Uh, let's see, uh, what do I remember about Kermit on a bike? Secret of the Muppets. Secret of the Muppets. Um, yes, we're talking massive rigs here, correct? Yes. Mm-hmm. So you have, uh, it's, I guess it's not so simple after all. Uh, we have um, uh, Kerm uh, Kermit on the bike. Uh, the ho the hole on the bike on the bike sequence uh, that was in the Great Muppet Caper, though. Yeah. Only that was even more complex, as they had separate separate rigs. And if you want me to break this down simplistically, think marionettes, only crane sized. Oh. oh. Damn. It's, uh... Oh, wait. Whoa, fudge. Cra I can feel it's <laughs> crane-sized. <laughs> that would be... Just for a Kermit on a bicycle? Yep. Dude. 
Wow. Well, they did it for... Mind-blowing awesomeness. Well, they did it for long-legged bounding creatures in the Dark Crystal. Why not? And, and even the final shot during the, the finale, a.k.a. the Magic Store, I do recall they had to load every single pop bit in that final shot. They wanted to use the entire Henson archive from Sesame Street, Land of Gorge, all the Muppet Show characters they had at the time, even Thog, or... Uh, yeah, whatever, Thigger Thug, the, the blue one. Um, and I remember they had to not just get the puppeteers they had, but even people that never worked with puppets before, like John Landis and Tim Burton confirming they were in that giant mosh pit of puppets. Hmm. Yeah, because, yeah, that, that is true. Because, like, like you know, it seems like, it seems like a sweet thing. Like, you see all the Muppets just singing Rainbow Connection and stuff like that, but then suddenly, like, you realize that's a lot of freaking Muppets, you know? Mm -hmm. Plus the fact that some Muppet, like, a lot of Muppets need two people to work on, or, like, even in some cases three, it, it's crazy. Yeah. It really is. Well, they, um... I, I, I think, um... Uh, I... I... I'm actually not too surprised to to hear that they had people like that in the in that crowd because you, you know you you think about it and you're like okay so we got the the main guys the main performers on the on the main Muppets you know because they're they're the ones with the most experience and then we got other guys who didn't play with uh, who probably just didn't play with puppets as much doing doing some of the characters in the background. Because they don't have to do much except move the mouth or sway back and forth, you know, keep it easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's true. Yeah. I, I have heard of some other projects that, like, sometimes they would just hire random people in order to, you know, just fill in the gaps for them. But, like, for the Muppets, like, it make, it make, it would make a lot of sense, like... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm already looking at a picture right now, and it really feels like a really crammed, crammed space. So it's it's, it's just been hot down too. there. <laughs> yeah, it's like a sub. It's like a it's like a subway train. Mm. <laughs> just of everybody swaying and all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, even Jim went to great lengths to do actual full size things, like build a giant animal for the showdown sequence and stuff like that so it was always again pushing the boundaries of puppetry farther than the show has ever done mm. and we're talking about 137 puppeteers in that giant arena right there Jeez. some of them not even puppeteers mm. Mm -hmm. so yeah that that is a pretty crazy thought and plus hold on yeah where is it that I'm gonna go with this I don't know. Where are you going? Crap, I'm drawing a blank. <clears throat> <laughs> I want to say something intellectual, oh. but my brain refuses me to. Uh, that's our mat. Dun 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 dun. Yay. <laughs> Alright, so are we going to move, move on to the great Muppet Caper? Well, we didn't talk about the plot. Oh. <laughs> We didn't even start with the. With the you didn't, guys didn't talk movie. about the. You didn't. You didn't. Why? What you talked about? Technical stuff and not the plot. Well, it was the last thing that came to mind. The important thing about the Muppets is how, you know, in Jim's care, he was always trying to push the boundaries of puppetry. It wasn't just doing ventriloquism. It was going one step and next, and that's what the film was. It was a technical achievement. In terms of the story, it's arguably The Wizard of Oz, but with the Muppets. They're sort of following a goal, following a dream, and even we have that sort of thing, and that's how we can really connect with them. Because you want to see them go far, make it big. They have this ambition. It's not to be rich and famous. It's just to make people happy, make them laugh. And interestingly enough, um, I wish I sent this to you guys, but ToughPigs.com did a review of a script of a rough draft that was far different, far loonier, and to put it bluntly, it would be Blazing Saddles Jr., where it'd have, like, Harvey Corman pop in. No, is it, it's, it's either Harvey Corman or Harvey, um, 
someone else popping in complaining he didn't get a cameo or something like that, and it would have been loonier, zanier. But I think the biggest difference is in that one, the whole idea was that the Muppets would be going after just to be rich and famous. And even um, Orson Welles' cameo would have like a big pot of gold next to him, and he'd be like, hey, you want some? Dig in. And it would have diminished the film, because it's like, do the Muppets want to be entertainers just for the sake of making people laugh, or do we want them just to be greedy just for the sake of being as big as sliced bread or the Beatles? And comparing that to the final cut where it's more about chasing a dream it really begins to question are you in it just to make people entertained feel glad about themselves or are you in it just to make a fast buck like doc hopper well like it, well here's the thing it, it, it's pretty much well like think of how we do our it's pretty much in a sense like how we do our videos do we do it just so we can get the subscribers count and like i don't know whatever whatever we can get on blip or is it more the fact that we want to express ourselves you know we just want to just follow up on our dream of entertaining people yeah. and, and that, that's kind of the thing like as you know and considering how the like with the mupp how the muppets are like with the muppet show and all that stuff having the idea of like them going for the for the money and for the fame it would not only like kind of kind of like make the make the movie have a bit of that have a bad feeling but also just the muppets in general yeah. because like this is supposed to be a bit like a like a prequel to the muppet show mm. And, like, the thing is, is that, like, if you're thinking, like, all, all, everything in the Muppet, like, everything what the Muppet movie has led to, and, like, all that you see in the Muppet show, like, if it's just for the fame and money, then it feel, it would feel heartless, in mm. a sense. Like, it would send out a wrong message. Yeah. And it's funny, too, because Jerry Jewell, a really, really important factor toward a force of the Muppets, a really, really big writer who's been there since day one, when he was compiling the draft and the later ones, he always used elements from Jim's life, working with commercials, um, meeting with different people, learning their talents, and saying, hey, I got this crazy band here, you want to join in? And it's sort of interesting when you sit back and kind of put it together after going into Jim's life and making the comparisons. It's like, wow, in a way, it's sort of this big tongue-in-cheek feature film that reflects Jim's life as well. But at the same time, viewing it as a movie on its own, it, it pretty much has that lasting timeless power, just like The Wizard of Oz, where it's basically just going after things... Um, for what you know is right as opposed to just doing things just for the sake of following what others have done mm. and by the way it was Henry Kissinger I was thinking of I apologize Oops. Um, and also very briefly there was a version I sent um, you and James I know James didn't see the original but this was a version that believe it or not had longer footage that wasn't in the American version mm-hmm Oh yeah, 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 that's true. That's true. I got the recobbled cut. <laughs> well, not, not really the recobbled cut. Everything looks complete. You don't see sun in storyboards or rough animation. No, no, no. It, it's really just from a laser disc from the UK. But weirdly enough, over in the UK, they had a longer version, and it had some extended scenes. And a fan restored it. And if you do hunt this down, it is worth checking out. Um, there's a couple of extra bits here and there, a longer recap scene with Dr. Teeth. The biggest highlight, of course, is the longer version of I Hope That Something Better Comes Along is in this version. And it's funny because I remember as a kid listening to the soundtrack and thinking to myself, where is this section in the movie, this bit where Rolf is going about Irish setters and talking about a new leash on life? Which sadly got cut because it would have been too much for the kids. Is that a new leash on life? Oh yeah, sorry about that. Two, three, four. <laughs> but I think the biggest one that makes me cry more is the ending. Just seeing everything fall over and Crazy Harry having more explosions with the light and stuff. Because it just really feels satisfying. 
it's like going over all these obstacles, getting past everything, just to make it to the end of it and achieving what you've done. And those lines keep believing, keep pretending we've set out what we've done to do. It just really brings me to tears to say Jim really accomplished what he planned out to do. And it's just bittersweet to see it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, de- de- definitely, definitely. Yeah. On a very brief side note, and again, I'm sorry for stalling. Anyone think Doc Copper was a strong villain out of curiosity? Ooh, Mr. Froglegs? Mm. Uh, <sighs> eh. Eh. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. He uh, he sets the standard for the future, uh, for many of the future villains of the Muppet movies. And by that I mean uh, he's uh, uh, he's probably more two dimensional cardboard cutout than the uh, than the felt characters that we're rooting for. Well, that's sort of the funny thing. With me, it's it's a little different. <clears throat> um, for the longest time, I thought he was weak, but upon revisiting it, the thing that I found intriguing was how he doesn't really feel like that strong of a villain. But then as the film builds along, it becomes a little more threatening, where he's actually forcing Kermit to actually you know, do his own bidding and all that sort of stuff and free will. Um, and it, it does get a little intense. It, it does get pretty intense especially at the end where he actually forces him at gunpoint to do these commercials but i don't know it, it's really half and half it's sort of a slow slow build up it's not memorable like the wicked witch but in, in some way it is iconic in its own right mm-hmm. especially considering mm-hmm. the idea of having a restaurant serving french fried frog legs sounds delish mm. but uh mm. At, at the same time, you kind of think to yourself, okay, why would you, why would you, why would you ask someone of a, of a different species to advertise what you're, advertise the fact that you're eating them? Well, let's put it this way, uh... Pepe the King Prong Shrimp was a spokesperson for Long John Silver. Yeah, that is true. Um, yeah, that was true. So the, so they, it it took them about twenty years or so, but they finally uh, turned into what they what they were making fun of. Mm-hmm, yes. Ironically, yeah. Yeah. Mhm. Yeah. It does really damn long enough to figure it out. So, <clears throat> on to yes. the Great Muppet Caper. So, yeah, let's, um, and just so you know, that I have not seen the Muppet movie or the Great Muppet Caper, so you guys have to pretty much fill that gap for me, because I really came into the Muppets during Muppets Take Manhattan, which we'll talk about after. Oh, and wait, we'll get to Muppet that caper. Oh, and wait till we get to that one. <laughs> so... What do you guys like about uh, the Great Muppet Caper, the sequel that came out in '81? Well, the uh, from from where I'm standing, uh, the uh, I I thought it was uh, I I thought it was an all around funnier movie. Mm. Uh, they follow the same they follow the same formula that's. Uh, that's been set into place with the first film. They've got all their all their cameos in place. Only this time they've got they've got more cameos from the uh, the the Muppet players themselves, including Jim. And uh, <clears throat> it um, it 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 even has uh, probably. Uh, a stronger, more interesting story, but the the technicals are also are also uh, any up on top of everything else. Um, 
with uh, with Muppet Caper, you you have a story where uh, Kermit, Fozzie, and Gonzo they they actually come out in the beginning and they're they they pretty much admit. Okay, you know, they say to the audience, okay, in this movie, this is our role here. We're investigative reporters uh, working for this newspaper. And they have to, uh, they have to go over, they have to go after something pretty easy to, pretty easy to grasp. Uh, uh, they have to uh, crack open the case of a diamond heist that, uh, that happened right under their noses. Literally. And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, uh, the overall execution of everything, I, I feel like um, this the stakes are higher in this, and uh, the uh, the action, the humor, the pacing it's it's all a lot more it's all a lot more spectacular. Uh, this was the. This this felt to me like the the stronger, of the group. Mm-hmm. Um, for me personally, I feel like this is a major step up for the Muppets, where the first where the first film is their step to move to the big to like to make the for their first step, like to enter into the realm of the, of movies. This one. It, it it's um it feels like they're it's like the Muppets' first standalone film in a sense that they don't have to rely on the TV show or anything like that in order to make a movie. Like they're pretty much set. this is where they the Muppets establish themselves not just as characters from a TV show but as actors essentially that they can go and. You know, like, they can play any part they want, and, like, sometimes you, you can actually believe that they are these characters. And, like, l- at, and later on in later movies, you, you'll see that often that really is the case. Sometimes, like, sure, you definitely see that, yes, it is Kermit, it is Fozzie, it is Gonzo, like, there's no mistaking. But it's, like, but it, it, in a way... Like you don't see them as you, their selves, like the like Kermit the Frog. You don't really see Kermit as the host. You see Kermit as the journalist, or like Fozzie Bear. Like you, you don't see them. He, you don't see him as just a comedian or Gonzo as this like uh, epic stuntsman. Like they have a different. They're playing a different role in this movie. So, so yeah, that, that's pretty much what I ju- what I want to say about it is how the Great Muppet Caper pretty much establishes how the Mupp- how the Muppets are not only viewed as just like characters, they're like actors. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Okay. The funny thing behind Great Muppet Caper is that straight from the opening, they promise everything that they're going to have, spectacle, fantasy, stuff that you'll never see, and they really do live up to that title. They they certainly do. Um, I think the funny thing behind The Great Muppet Caper is that it plays itself as a comedy, but it's the kind of comedy that, you know, you really want to expect. It's laugh a minute. It's unpredictable, especially on first-time viewing. The jokes never age that much. And interestingly enough, for a footnote, it's the first and only Muppet movie Jim Henson ever directed, which makes it all the more intriguing as later on he would pursue other things. Um, It it sort of models itself after those classic Road 2 movies by Bob Hope and the heist films, and as a comedy, it works on every single level. The rising shenanigans, the crazy situations, and just the atmosphere itself even the beginning they state it's a movie it's not in the real world it's in a different world it's the Muppets world and just how it's interacting with its own you know view of reality breaking the fourth wall and um, crazy shenanigans from left and right 
And even parodying the idea of the heist films itself, I mean, the whole subplot with, you know, Fozzie and Kermit being twins. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, the, you're the, uh... Yeah, the, the, the joke is on everybody in the film's universe, but the and audience then, is getting it. And that's what makes the film work so well. It's very, very self-aware. It's very cartoony, but not cartoony to the point where it's too obvious. It's obvious in the plot and the characters, and there's even moments where they do break the fourth wall and address that, but in a very subtle and unpredictable way. I think my funny, my favorite line is where Miss Piggy's getting arrested, and she points out how um, um, Mrs. Darling's... Uh, uh, the f- this guy that that this guy that she uh, that she has had a relationship with that um, that appeared in in her uh, that appeared in her uh, romantic musical fantasy. She points uh, out Nick, that Nick, he was sorry. dubbed. Yeah, yeah, Nick Holiday. Nick, that, that's what it was. You know, you you don't even sing. Your voice was dubbed. Mm-hmm. And don't think I didn't notice that when I was a kid watching the movie either. I always thought, well, that sounds a little bit different. <laughs> and, and, and even on the side, they even toss in jokes, you know, for the adults too. Like there's that lengthy sequence where she breaks into the house of um, John Cleese playing a middle-aged homer, um, homeowner, and they're just parodying the obvious um, snooty rich people who don't really give a care about what happens. Mm-hmm. It's like, we, we, we're rich, so what? We're just going to move on. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. People can break into our house. Oh, look, there's a pig cr- uh, climbing up the side of the house. Um, is it one of our pets? <laughs> we don't have any pets. They were dead, remember? Oh, oh. right. All right. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. Uh, because why not add a bit of Monty Python? Yeah. Other a... good humor is always welcome. Yeah. On a sentimental level, and I'm really sorry for bringing this up, um, but you remember the park scene with the um, father and the daughter as they're walking past Kermit, and you hear the girl go, Look, Daddy, that's a bear. No, sweetie, that's a frog. Bears wear hats. Hmm. Yeah. Um, that was actually one of the rarest moments we actually saw Jerry Nelson and Jerry Nelson's daughter, believe it or not. Oh. I would explain why it's her only appearance, but not to sour the evening, um, I'll leave it at that. It, it's not terrible, it's just one of those, oh, oh, she lives on in celluloid, that's a plus. Yeah. 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 It's like not, um, hold on, uh, let me just write a little something. Like it's not th- it's not this bad. Just to check. Uh, f- no, 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 no. It, okay. It's it, it's it's not that bad. Okay. Um, good. no, no. It's it's this bad. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't laugh, Mike. It's not funny. Oh my god! <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't even know what you guys are referencing, so I'm just laughing. Maybe I should. Oh wow! You weren't listening, weren't you? <laughs> you cheeky bastard! We're talking about <laughs> the late Christine Nelson here. Oh my god! I understand having a moment where, like, I don't really understand. I'll just laugh and move on. This is not the time, dude. On a more, this ain't the time. Uh, on a more hopeful note, um, if it does help, Edgar Bergen, uh, again, I hate to jump back, um, his appearance in the Muppet movie would be his last one. And it's interesting how Jim was a complete idol and really did use him as an influence, so it wouldn't be long until he did get an autograph telling Jim, you know, good for you pursuing and breaking new ground and that was a pretty good compliment in many cases when you know Edgar Bergen and, and his characters ranging from Mormon Titer Snurd um, to Charlie 
Mm-hmm. But, no, but like at least he had a mo. Like it, it's that that I will admit that is bittersweet. It is more bittersweet, but at least Jim Henson does have that did had that moment. And even the reason too for getting Christine in the film, uh, Christine Nelson was to at least become a member of the actors' union, so she did have a good time at least. Hmm. So I guess it's more of a bitter that uh, as well. That too is a more bittersweet thing. Yeah, and it even is pretty nice when the film is sort of very like that. It knows when to be quiet and subtle, even during the bike ride scene, which you know, of course, we talked about previously. How you see so many Muppets with different you know rigs and all that sort of stuff, and just the way that again they're taking something so simple. And yet they're expanding upon it. You've seen Kermit ride a bike. Well, now here's a whole bunch of them, and just the way they pursue in achieving that impossibility. Mm-hmm. Fun fact: if you look really closely in the last shot when they're panning above, you'll see Brian Henson in the front on this giant tricycle. Because if he wasn't there, let's just say all the Muppets would collapse like broccoli. Oh God. <laughs> and I that would be an outtake imagine, worth paying for. <laughs> I could just imagine that scene where all of them is in the bike, and then suddenly, like Jim goes and cut, <laughs> claps. <laughs> get, oh, get the jaws of life, animals down, animals down. <laughs> it's. Uh, uh, it's like it's like they they all suffered like some kind of heat stroke and all fainted at once. Yeah. It's funny because I grew up on the Muppet movie and the Great Muppet Caper, but I never, unfortunately, had the chance to see Take Manhattan until the new Muppet movie in 2011 came out. Mm. And I guess is where we should segue into here. Um, yeah. It, it's funny. You can come in now, Mike. You're you're welcome to join the group again. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you, guy. You don't have to, you don't have to be silent, Mister uh, Hudson, honey. Do you can join in? Yeah, like even if uh, like, th- there are times when I I don't know about some movies they don't talk about yet. I still join in. Yeah. I pull out stupid jokes, but still, I join. I'm just half. Uh actually trying to remember myself of the Muppet Takes Manhattan because it's been a while since I've seen the film so I'm kind of reading the plot trying and I'm picturing it in my head and the film overall (laughs) Uh, where should I begin with the film Um, um, so uh, the summary of the film in a whole is just pretty much the Muppets tried to uh, go to New York to get a musical on Broadway but it's harder than you think to to do that so a lot of shenanigans happen in between to get that Broadway musical on Broadway and I remember watching this and eh? um well isn't the uh, when you when you think about the the plot just from that alone doesn't it seem a little bit like a rehashing of the of the plot of the Muppet movie only instead of trying to make a make a show they're trying to make a show yeah that <laughs> that is true like yeah it, it's true it does feel like a little bit like something like when you when you hear the plot you do want, you do feel like something doesn't really seem right it doesn't seem that big like even after the great muppet caper where like they elaborated so many things and it's so big and then suddenly like muppets take manhattan and it's like oh now they're gonna go make a show on broadway it's like eh, is that really something you want to follow up to like after the great muppet caper well it was either that or showing what would be like if miss piggy and kermit had a kid Ooh. <laughs> that idea well, was that idea was vetoed straight off the bat. 
No, it was actually picked up. Uh, at, it was picked up long after. I know, I know. I was gonna mention that later. Oh, ooh. Yeah. This I gotta hear. <laughs> when that time comes. Yeah, but but no, takes Manhattan. As I said, it wasn't one I grew up on as a kid. Um, for me personally, it was Caper and the Muppet Movie. Those are the only two I grew up on, and you know the Disney collaboration. So when the Henson Corporation got bought out by Columbia TriStar for a short amount of time and I started reissuing the videos one of them was Take Manhattan and when I found out they did a third movie I just was really really ticked I was like wait a minute there's a third one? Really? Where have you been all my life? But even then I didn't see it I still held on for some reason and then finally I heard they were doing another Muppet film and I sat down I watched it and I'm trying to think back to what my reaction was. I think I was a little bit positive. Cause it was like, you know, I'm finally done. It's like, I finally saw this movie. Yes, yes. And then one year later, I think to myself, there was a shotgun wedding? Really? Um. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a while since I've seen that. Like, I, I, I was just there like, what? Yeah, like, uh, Miss Piggy, I thought Gonzo was supposed to be the priest. <laughs> um, it, it's funny because it's nice to see them, you know, take a break from trying to one-up each other in some sort of way. But the th when you really do think about it, Take Manhattan really does seem a little laid back, even when they're doing complex things like, you know, rats working in a diner um, or the Muppet Baby sequence, which was a pain to shoot, I heard, because of how small the room was and how cramped the puppeteers were trying to perform Baby, Kermit, Gonzo, and Fozzie and Animal. Um, which later on would become a big phenomenon on television. Do, 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 do. Um, I'm not Sandra Bullock here. <laughs> Damn it. Um, <laughs> you had me at Sandra Bullock. Um, Takes Manhattan is interesting because it seems like something's there and they go with the idea. You mean all this time they look up to Kermit, but then, of course, he just flat out says, you know, why do you always keep coming to me with these questions? Why do you always keep coming to me when I don't know the answers? And I will admit, it is an interesting character change, especially when going that saying goodbye number but then after that when they get back together it's like oh we need last minute conflict okay let's have Kermit have amnesia done that's our third act and that's where I think the film really falls apart because it's like we need to have conflict because we don't have a villain for this whole thing and it really feels a little off to me to be honest because even you have other plots too, like Miss Piggy stalking Kermit. <laughs> She's literally stalking Kermit. It's like, wow, just wow. Yeesh. I mean, okay, there are some interesting jokes, but when you really do sit back, it's like it's a good try, I guess, for what it is. I mean, they did attempt uh, something, and it's the first movie Frank Oz um, directed in terms of a solo direction and if it wasn't for learning off of Jim Strades with The Dark Crystal um, he wouldn't have known how to make films so at the very least it was the first attempt at Oz doing a romantic film with Muppets and it succeeded and failed in some way because... Like it was okay Yeah, that, that's... It, when you really do boil down to it, it it's just watchable. Mm -hmm. But the funny thing, too, is even when they were talking to the press about the wedding scene, they were very ambiguous as to whether they really got married or not, which is interesting. Because even in interviews, um, Frank Oz, as Piggy pointed out, that the priest, was, the reverend or whoever, was a real reverend, and he was. Mm. Well, so how do you marry Muppet? How do you marry puppets together? <laughs> well, th this is the thing. Like, usually when it comes to relationships between, like, fictional characters and stuff like that, often it's a real... It's a real, controver it's a real controversial issue because you never know, like, if they actually are married or not. Like, yeah. in some cases, um, one good example is actually Mickey and Minnie. 
mm-hmm. because you think like over the years like they they've been together for like decades and decades but like so, like you never know if they had like an official wedding now of course you could you could say like there have been event like special like disney world events or stuff like that but nothing like that's too official often like big fictional characters like these rather it be mickey mouse mickey and minnie or kervin and miss piggy like if they do make it like an official wedding where they're officially husband and wife like that would actually make big news like Mm -hmm. Like, how, like if a if a major celebrity like George Clooney and uh, I don't know, freaking Angelina Jolie are getting married. Yeah. I don't know why I picked these two. They picked those two, but like it, it's just an example. <laughs> uh, I really Did hadn't thought of it that big. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um. No, but yeah, like the thing is, yeah, like just to, and also just another thing to add regarding the that marriage thing is mostly they would once again bring it up in well it, it's a bit of a, too much of a fast forward but they they brought it up again in um what was it muppets most wanted yes like a, as the final scene and everything but like but if you bring up the issue if you bring up that scene with muppets take manhattan like, is it actually an official thing? Hmm. hmm. Well, here's... Oh, that door is really... Uh... Here's where where I'm going to start butting in here. Uh, Muppets Take Manhattan... It, if you haven't guessed by now, this is uh, the third uh, film in the series. Uh, there's no continuity. Yeah. Each, yeah. each film has its own distinct universe it's uh so you know they like with uh with the first uh muppet movie they they have piggy and kermit meeting for the first time instant love in muppet caper uh they have the meeting for the first time again instant love (laughs) Yeah, d- I'm not noticing a, a trend here, am I? Uh, but, um... So... Well, like, Great Muppet Caper is different. Like, they, they established that there are more different characters. And in the, uh... In the uh, Muppets Take Manhattan, they... Uh, they establish that they've all known each other since college. Because that's where the film starts out. Which is... Uh, at least uh, from from where I'm getting the ideas, you know, the the start of life. So um, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say even though they get married at the end of the end of that one, no, they're not they're not officially married because uh. At, at what point did they ever bring that up in the films that followed? Yeah, that sounds a bit like the... Con- yeah, I, I get what you mean. Like, if they met through college, but then, like, what happened with the first Muppet movie, what the heck? It's kind of like the continuity between Monsters, Inc. and Monsters University, where, like, in Monsters University, that's how Mike and Sully were, like, actually met. But then there's that one line in Monsters, Inc. where, like... My, mm. uh, Mike looked at Sully and said, "You were jealous of my good looks since the fourth grade." Yep. Yeah, and it's actually one of my fans who uh, actually uh, pointed me out. And I was like, "That is true," you know. Like often, like, do you want to stick? Like, it is a true question regarding: Do you want to stick stick in canon to the movies and like everything that you have done, or do you want to be your own thing? Mm-hmm. And like. I won't mind that much if the if Muppets Take Manhattan wants wants to be its own thing, but like it's trying to it's like it's a little bit there there are events that would technically be pretty big, rather it be the Muppets meeting in college, or like Kermit and Miss Piggy getting married. Those are pretty huge events when it comes to the Muppets universe, mm-hmm. but like if you want others to follow. 
or not like that that depends like do you want others to follow you and acknowledge what what you have done or do you want them to ignore your existence I don't know if that's all the if that, that that's all quite the same. Well, uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm making it sound harsh or something like that, or I don't know. It, it it's less complicated than than you think. I I think it's just okay. Here's the situation. Take our take these characters that we've created. Whatever history they have, wipe it clean. Do whatever. And learn to fly again. mm Hmm. Or you know what would be the case? Mm. I just realized something. Maybe, like... This might sound crazy, but maybe, like, the script already existed before the idea of Muppets Take Manhattan, but without the Muppets. And they decided later on to add it, add it in. Mm. So they... <clears throat> so the, the canon it, idea that? would be, okay, so they... They all they all met on their road trip. Uh, uh, they got successful doing the Muppet Show, and then they decided, uh, Muppets take Manhattan. Hey, let's let's start from scratch. Let's let's go to college and pretend afterward like nobody knows us. Well, no, that, that that's not really what I mean. Mm. I, I mean, like before, before like the script was already made. But it had, like, different original characters. But, like, they looked at the script and said, like, it needs something more. So they decided to add in the Muppets and just retweak the script, the script a bit so that, like, it can feel more Muppet-oriented. Um, you get what I mean? Kind of like uh, Die Hard with a Vengeance. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like Die Hard with a Vengeance. But I like Die Hard with a Vengeance. It was a script previously before they decided to write it into a Die Hard, Die Hard script. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. We're not saying that it's bad. We're just saying that that we're just giving using that as an example. I know. I I I was too focused on my um, (laughs) imaginary friend who lives in my thumb. (laughs) No, we just (laughs) what. Mr. Thimble will not will not disagree with you. Don't worry. So, oh, his name's a Mr. Thimble. So, so it's I gotta, Mr. Fibble. Oh, Thimble. <laughs> so How many I times did he go on the moon? Question. <laughs> Forty-two. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, I got a random off-tangent question. Okay. Related to this film. So, this movie introduced the concept of Muppet Babies. Have you seen the TV show? Yes. At some point, everybody, everybody has. I think has. at one point, yeah. I think at one point, but it's way too far for me to remember. I. Okay, just. just I only remember it because, brain. gee, uh, as a child of the '80s, uh, you couldn't go anywhere. You couldn't. You couldn't spend the night at anybody else's house and wake up on Saturday morning without knowing it. So yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's pretty yeah. much your. Al- it's pretty much you wake up and it's like your alarm clock is. Happy baby, <laughs> your dreams come true. If it was animal, it'd be worse. It'd be like, wake up, wake up, wake up, doing in the CBS. <laughs> CBS, CBS. <laughs> and if you're a Canadian, CBC, CBC. <laughs> 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 Um, would it be on CB? Oh, I probably would, actually, yeah. yeah. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> I think I should briefly... Uh, do we have anything else to say about Take Manhattan? Um... Nah, nah, I think I'm good. I, I think I should briefly mention, um, upon reading Jim's biography, there was something interesting I came across. Um, after working with the films, he wanted to work in different fields, of course, the Dark Crystal and Labyrinth. Yeah. And those, well, you know, Dark Crystal was a success, but it wasn't, like, huge because the critical reception was mixed, but it did manage to find an audience regardless. Um, Labyrinth was a bomb, 
because he thought, you know, people didn't like Dark Crystal because it was all puppets and there weren't any humans, so let's just do a Muppet Show fantasy-esque kind of movie with David Bowie in the mix, um, or something like that. And after that, you know, didn't do so well, it really was a personal blow to Jim, because he worked so hard on it, and it was like this big backstab. It was like, I want to do something great and creative, but it was rejected. Why Why did they think this sort of thing? And so he turned to television, and that's when the Jim Henson hour came underway, and you guys are going to learn some new information I came across. Mm-hmm. There is another reason mm-hmm. why... There's another reason why the Jim Henson Hour bombed. Really? But really? Like, but I thought it had like several seasons. It had it? one. It had one season. It was 13 episodes, and three of them didn't air, except if you count the two on Nickelodeon. That was um, my show. I know, James. I know it was mine too. Um, <laughs> I remember there were several. Okay. Well, so, anyways, go in, on. in all seriousness, um. Jim's original idea was to do a Walt Disney Presents kind of format, which would have been great. First week would have been The Storyteller, which was new and not doing so well. Second week would have been a behind-the-scenes... No, no, it would have been something called Lead Free TV, which was basically about these two mechanics trying to create a show station and dealing with celebrities and stuff. It'd be like The Muppet Show, but with new characters, and The Muppets wouldn't even be in it. Um, Third week would be one-hour picture book, storybook adaptations like Emma and Otter's Jug Band Christmas or The Tale of the Bunny um, Picnic. Um, Fourth week would be anything, just legitimately anything. It could be a fairy tale about a bowling ball, the Muppets on a detective story in space, just anything. And Brandon Tarakoft, who was very open to this idea, said, okay, we commission it. Then shit hit the fan. The executives came back and they didn't like the idea of a four week thing and they said let's have it be a one hour segment just one hour segment and as long as you have the muppets in there everything will be great and on the side jim had you know wanted to go with the original idea and he said okay fine we'll play it your way and as a result they had the first half being devoted to the muppets and the second half being jim's anything hour Guess which one critics responded more favorably to? The, the first half. The second half. Whoa. Oh. They, well, for those who were at least a little more open to the first one, they at least admitted it was a good attempt. Others didn't like the material. The comedic material felt awkward, some of it forced, and a lot of people just really didn't like the style of writing of the sketches they felt it was far removed from what the Muppet Show was which was zany crazy vaudevillian unpredictable here they felt it was more like sitcom writing and the new characters such as Digit Leon and among others were flat and not perfect and they felt the first half was more focused on technology and less on centering characters and all that malark and this was a bigger blow to Jim Because this is the point where he said, okay, Labyrinth didn't do well. Here I am coming back with the Muppets. And even, and by the way, um, Muppet Family Christmas got praised, so good thing there. Mm. But in terms of the Jim Henson hour, he was really disheartened to hear that he felt people were starting to lose touch with the Muppets. It's like he couldn't do anything else anymore. He couldn't do any more projects. And that was when the Disney deal came to mind. Mm. And again, I'll be brief because this is about the films. But again, for the love of God, read the biography by Brian J. Jones. It is fucking worth it. Every single page of it. Um, But I'll be very brief on the details. It was a good idea at first. There was a lot of excitement. Eisner was excited. Kratzenberg was like, oh, 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 um, yay. Uh, and then when they started well, collaborating... Of course, Jeffrey. Oh, 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 wait to hear this one, Matt. You, If you knew about this, you would have at least put Kratzenberg on a higher spot. You um, mean Katzenberg? Katzenberg, sorry. Um, he's saying Kratzenberg. He's like, what? Krapsenberg. <laughs> Crab apple? <laughs> Krapsenberg. 
Anyway. Or you want to go with some jerk with a camera, call him Kitty Katzenberg? <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay, that, that worked fine. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the deal was going straight at first, and then problems arised. Mm. The contract came in, and it specifically stated that they were going to get the Muppets, period. No Sesame Street Muppets, and there's a really good reason why. To quote Yogurt from Spaceballs, Merchandising, merchandising, where the real money is made. And the thing is, the merchandising of Sesame Street was literally funding the show. Because PBS, well, they were local programming, and you can imagine how low their pockets were. What better way but to at least have books, toys, all that sort of stuff literally going back into the show for new Muppet props, stages, mm -hmm. technology, and all that stuff. Had Disney gotten their hands on it, it would have been chaos, and the show that they were doing for PBS wouldn't even get funded at all. And that would completely ruin the original intentions of the show's existence. So that was number one. Number two, they were not just getting puppets, they were getting performers. So you had this questionable agreement on whether or not the performers were, the performers were going to get paid as well. And that was a problem right there, because it leads to problem number three, that was the final nail in the coffin. Kitty... Kratzenberg, was it? K Kavit... Jeffrey. Katzenberg. Kat... Jeffrey. Um, Jeffrey. The Dreamers. Yeah, just go, 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 go with Jeffrey. Yeah, Jeff, Jeffrey, Jeffrey, Jeff. <sighs> Good. Frickety God. Where do I begin? He was a nightmare. He just... Ugh. I came from Wall Street, so I know better than everybody here. These people are not even magical people. They're just people. I don't care if they bring Kermit and Piggy to life. I am gonna bad mouth the ever loving fuck out of them for all I care. Yeah, that. I mean, it does sound like Jeffrey Katzenberg during the days of Disney because back then, when Jeffrey Katzenberg was hot, was hired at Disney during the mid '80s, he had no knowledge on um, animation on what Disney is, is doing in animation he knows a great deal about movies and when it comes to when it comes to the live action films that Disney had during that back then they, they were fantastic hmm. like with, with the touchstone name and all that stuff it's just Jeffrey had no clue what to do with animation you think that's bad who <laughs> think it would be if you had the Muppets in control Jeez, my god. It was terrible. It broke Jim down. And even when he went to Eisner, Eisner at least was there to calm him down. He was there to at least give him a good bear hug and say, it's okay. Come to me. And then, of course, there was a lunch where he said, about this Sesame Street deal. And then Jim told him to fuck off, and that was it. <laughs> oh, god. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. In my own words, but legitimately, he did. <laughs> no, tell no, him no, off no, about no. That. I know. No. That, uh, you know, this would make. Like, uh, yeah. This would all be. Uh, a, a great uh, a great plot for the next Muppet movie, you know the the Muppets take on Jeffrey Katzenberg. <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't even make a villain that resembles Jeffrey Katzenberg. Yeah, but no. Um, even when things started souring and they started working with Imagineers, which was the only good thing because they did the 3D mm -hmm. movie, which was the last project Jim. Yeah, ever Muppet. Did. Yeah, Muppet Vision 3D. <laughs> Legitimately, he had other ideas like a restaurant that served pizza and stuff like that, a parody of mm -hmm. the great movie ride with the Muppets, interacting scenes. Mm -hmm. But because of the rising tensions between the company and Jim, and worst of all, other problems that were going on with him, which, again, I won't reveal because it's worth reading the biography just to know what happened. Um, I'm going to push Morgan, uh, Morgan, just wondering, um, does this... Does this podcast right now have sponsors by any chance? <laughs> it does. <laughs> you keep mentioning about this great book. How it much is. does it cost? Gee. <laughs> it's nothing more but $21 on Amazon and an arm and a leg. And your grandmother's mm -hmm. toe. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. No, but no, but go on. I just want okay, to okay. funny how you I, I, keep I advertising the book. It's like, go read the book, go read the book. <laughs> Because it is, I'm sorry, it's so well detailed, and even I can't do it justice, and I'm sorry if I'm pushing it, but I, I just can't help it. Um, 
things are worsening to the point where even Jim was relating it as the goddamn deal. So even mm-hmm. that was taking a toll on him. And, he, and keep in mind, he didn't sign anything yet. This was like P.L. Travers here. It was like, mm-hmm. I want to get a feel what these guys are before I even sign anything. And even there's already a whole lot of publicity over this thing. Mm-hmm. <sighs> so Coming soon in the, in the biopic Saving Mr. Henson. Oh, James, please, no, no, oh god, no, 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 bad timing, bad oh, timing. Oh, sorry. Because as we all know, due to the unfortunate timing of Jim's death, it really was a bit of a shock. All right, yeah. So it was all under the Henson kids to carry the legacy. Hell, even Eisner went forward and said, about the deal. They said, no. It was yeah, like, that was bad timing. It really was bad timing. It's a good thing they turned them away. But Sorry. The important thing was they wanted to carry the legacy. They wanted to continue working. Otherwise, there would just be three Muppet movies, a show, and that was it. And even at the time, they had another um, Muppet script called The Cheapest Muppet Movie Ever Made, which I'll talk about much later. Um, so... It was a, there was a point to see exactly where to begin, where to start, and I don't remember how it came to mind to do the Christmas Carol adaptation, but it was a really good lifesaver to say the least. Although, um, there is, I don't know if we if we do or if it, if it is appropriate right now, but like, um, could we? Like, could we just like back up a little bit and maybe like, if we can, would would, would it count if we talk about Muppet Vision 3D? Sure. Just a bit. Like we we did talk a little bit. Like I know we talked about like the hi- history aspect, but it's just like mostly it would be an interesting look to see like Muppet Vision 3D in itself. Uh, yeah. Well, technically it is a Muppet just, movie. It shows in it. theaters. So give it a good right. swing. Just go for sure. it. Right. Sure. The reason, okay, the reason why I, I wanted to bring up Muppet Vision 3D is mostly because this is actually my favorite Disney ride, period. Like, I, I go, like, whenever I would go to Disney World, I would go, I would watch Muppet Vision 3D at least three times during my stay. And plus the fact that it's literally one of the things that, that I grew up with the Muppets, like, this is how, like, I wouldn't say, I don't think this is where I started, but it's like, it's how I grew my love. And I gotta say, is I don't know if I'm talking of nostalgia or stuff like that, but it's practically the best 3D movie, like, 3D ride movie, like, I've seen. It is so, so well made, so elaborately well done, like, every note of it. Like, of course, we have, like, it does send out the, like, the, the zany Muppet a- antics that we know and love. Like, it has all of that. It definitely feels like we're watching a Muppet show, plus the fact that it does have a lot of song like, that it has some songs into it, and, like, it has different shows. But also, it, there's also the aspect of how it interacts, like, all around, like, all around you. Like, the set itself is literally a perfect recreation of the Muppet Theater. But also, the there's, like, a live, like, we see, like, a live um, orchestra of penguins, like, performing throughout the whole thing. We have, St- like, Statler and Waldorf, like, live, j- watching and commenting. And, we and like, even backstage, like, right behind you, you have the Swedish chef with the projector. And, like... One of, like two of the big things is that it, it mostly introduces like well maybe mostly one but it introduces it makes two characters like the main like two new main characters there's Bean Bunny and there's also Waldo the spirit of 3D now Bean Bunny I'm not 100% sure if he was in- introduced later on but it like was <clears throat> the the tale of the bunny uh, picnic he was introduced in I thought it was yeah. the Jim Henson hour no, 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 no. The bunny picnic picnic came before Jim Henson Hour. Okay. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like it, it really does, like it, it really does introduce a new character very well. Where like he's more of a kid who just want to help out with the show and all that stuff, and just wants to be a part of it. And then 
we got Waldo, the spirit of like Waldo is actually the first ever computer and um, yeah, computer animated uh, Muppet pretty much where like everything w- was controlled by uh, by a, a computer plus is like like it can shape shape shift and all that stuff like pra- like Waldo is practically a genie from uh, Aladdin pretty much. <laughs> Funny like, you should transformations and all. Uh, funny you should say that, uh, Waldo. Uh, I I do remember seeing the Jim Henson Hour episode. Uh, uh, they where they were talking about uh, behind the scenes stuff, and I think it was that show where where Waldo was first introduced. Or correct me if I'm wrong, Morgan. I was just about to say that. <laughs> no, the the show was the introduction of Waldo. He was the first live computer puppet. Mm-hmm. I was and just about to say that, like, um, it, it's, I was just about to say, like, I remember afterwards, like, they, they brought in Waldo, l- they brought in Waldo into the Jim Henson Hour, and, like, when I was, wa- when I saw the episodes of the Jim Henson Hour, I thought it was freaking amazing, like, like and they just made a reference to Muppet Vision 3D, so I was just, just like, <gasps> so it, it was amazing, yeah, so, it, mm-hmm. it, it's pretty much that. Like you get the zany mup, so pretty much you you th- that's that's what I want to say about Muppet Vision 3D. You get the zany uh, humor of the Muppets. Like it it pretty much does set up a a perfect Muppet show. Plus the fact that they do parody a lot of uh, 3D moments, which are which are greatly hilarious, which are great, and the 3D itself is like really phenomenal. Still, and the fact that what still. I mean, the 3D really still looks phenomenal. It, it's been, what, 20 oh, yeah. years and it holds yeah. up? Oh, yeah, definitely. It, it, it even looks better than whatever 3D movies in theaters, like, like near us. <laughs> and also the fact that um, what the... Ima- even, like, give credit to what the Imagineers did is um, amazing, bringing, all the, bringing the characters to life. Even if there's a moment... Where Sweetums actually comes out, he's not an animatronic. It's actually a performer, like ju- like just going out, ser- like searching for be- Bean Bunny. So yeah, it really does bring you into the world of the Muppets, and yeah, I I just really wanted to talk about it. It's my favorite ride ever, and Muppet Vision 3D. I salute you. It's it's definitely a monument in Disney Imagineering. And in terms of the Muppets, since it is the last project by Jim Henson. Mm-hmm. Great. So now that I got that off my chest. You guys want to know a secret? Hmm. I never hmm. went on the ride. You've never been on the ride? It was... I was 11. It was a honeymoon. Um, we were in MGM Studios. I desperately wanted to go to Muppet Vision 3D. Desperately. No, back, but we, we know we, what you went on instead. I I should have been rewarded that. It, it should have been like, okay, you went against Rod Serling's Tower of Terror. Now you get to see the Muppets. No, no, no. Thanks to my young sister at the time who was like, I don't want to go on the Muppet 3. My mother wanted to go to see Muppet Vision 3D. I want to go see Muppet Vision 3D, but no. It was my sister. It was my sister. <laughs> I went on the rock and roller coaster. I went on Space Mountain. I went on Terror, Tower of Terror. I deserve to see the Muppets in 3D. And no! 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 Stop! Are your childhood for life? You're not going to see the last thing at Jim ever. No! Your time will come, Morgan. You will go back to Disney World or Disneyland, and you will see Muppet Vision 3D. Mm. Your time will come. Yeah, and I'll see Tex Richmond with the boulders are going, Hey, we're installed in the Oogie Loops here. <laughs> Yeah, like Disney's gonna. Do oh, <laughs> like Disney's gonna let them have freaking Oogie Loves. They replaced Back of the Future with The Simpsons. Yeah, but that's Universal. Mm-hmm. We're talking about Disney here. They think about these things. Mm-hmm. Uh, sure. <laughs> Did they think when they removed Gurgi's Munchings and so... Crunchings Diner, <laughs> or the extra terrestrial theater? Okay. Yeah. Well, there's that, but they're not going. They're not going to replace the Muckabits with the Oogie Loves. 
In fact, there is one thing that I want to mention is that... Did they think when they um, replaced Journey Disney's into Imagination? Oh. What about What about Captain EO with Honey, uh, We Shrunk the Audience? I, okay, that one they switched back. They switched back. I don't know, I like both of those. No, but anyways, um, actually what I want to say is that um, they're actually planning to uh, make, at Disney's Hollywood Studios, at Disney World, they're actually planning to make the Muppet area uh, a lot bigger. Mm. They're go- like they're going to actually have um, a Swedish chef restaurant, and um, I think they're going to have a few more restaurants. Uh, there's no talks about a new ride, but they're, they are going to make uh, the Muppet section a lot bigger. Three years, and I still haven't gotten my fill yet. (laughs) (sighs) Done? Guys, done with that? Okay, yeah. Mm. I'm sorry, I just... My love for Muppet Vision 3D just kind of overpowered me. Let let me uh, introduce uh, the back-to-back direct dictatorial... Oh, I'm so drunk, I can't... Doc! (laughs) So that explains Let me talk why about Brian Hansen's directed movie. <laughs> yeah, I was I can't concentrate. I just was like, ugh. Dude, um, dude. So sp- Brian, so <laughs> smoke something. It will get you out of the consciousness. It's it will save you from the uh, loots. Uh, I'll uh, dude. I think I might do that later. But now I, I want to introduce it. But Brian Hansen films that he directed in the 90s uh two adaptations mind you of christmas carol and treasure island and i must say i must say guys guys i love the christmas carol it's a christmas staple in my house and treasure island is (laughs) my favorite muppet movies i mean pirates who doesn't love pirates man but there's a story yeah, we we can't. Sorry, what I'd say about Treasure Island, but you guys can go ahead and talk about Christmas Carol or Treasure Island. Uh, we can. Uh, uh, I I don't think you can. You can really talk about these these two films uh, separately. I mean that they they sort of they came in uh, during a time uh, when the Muppet franchise was following a certain wave, and that was. Uh, that that wave was, you know, adapting, uh, uh, mainly focusing on uh, adapting classic stories. Uh, didn't they have a they had yeah, a video yeah. series going at, around that time? Uh, they did. They were, uh, they were yes. sing along videos. In, be, in between, yes. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, one directed a uh, directed video called Muppet uh, Classic Theater. They did all ad- adaptations of fairy tales that went on video. So mm-hmm. yes, between... I remember that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I remember that. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's back yeah. up. Let's back up here. Hey, Cinderella and Frog Prince were done in the sixties and seventies. Um, yeah, yeah, that too. But this was. Yeah. Uh, I read it. Yeah. This was more like stuff like the elves and the shoemaker. Anyway. Um, oh that. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, and it had. Um, yeah, from what I remember, um, there was also like. Uh, there was like three little pigs, which starred, um, which starred Miss Piggy's brothers, and there was also um, Gonzo, who starred in Boy Who Cried Wolf. I remember those. Yeah, that's about <laughs> the classic theater. Yep. Oh my God, it's been a yep, long. That came oh out. God, it's been it's been a long time since I've heard if I since I've even heard of them mentioned about that. My God. I actually still have the VHS tape. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think I have them too, but I don't know where they are. Like. Well, right now I like I only have some of the sing-alongs, like Billy Bunny's Animal Songs and It's Not Easy Being Green. <laughs> well, so far mm-hmm. this is the ones I'm seeing. Well, the ones that I just found just by looking. But okay, um, so so yeah, these these two these two movies, uh, Muppet Christmas Carol and Muppet Treasure Island. There, those are these are the. Uh, the feature film adaptations of that of that concept, and mm-hmm. um, to uh, the reason why I think it it makes things more interesting here was that giving them the uh, was 
uh, before when they when they had the Muppet when they had the Muppet movie formula, which was uh, uh, put the Muppets in a different situation every movie and have a, a two dimensional villain. Um, <laughs> the uh, this uh, the the stories they picked here were good ones, or generally good ones that uh, that people were familiar with and had uh, had complexities to it. They they could um, they could install the Muppets in as as characters in these uh, classic literary tales, and uh, and see how they can work them in that in that universe. And what we get is uh, uh, the last uh, uh, the uh, the last exceptional Christmas Carol adaptation, at least according to my uh, opinion, and uh, one of the last solid uh, dare I say it, one of the last solid Muppet movies, period, that I remember uh, Muppet Treasure Island mm-hmm. um, which I haven't seen in years and I, I really should I really should, because uh, I, I still remember have I still remember, you know, going to school and telling my friends about it. Oh, this was so funny! Ha ha ha. Um. So that's that's my uh, that's my spiel for now. Yeah. If I, if I want to add anything about like these two adap- adaptations, is that like we mostly know about the story of uh, The Christmas Carol and Treasure Island, especially Christmas Carol, since it was since it's, it's, the, it's the number one story that's been retold and retold no matter what and what, what, the, what the Muppets did right is that often like when you have to, when you have to adapt these stories that, that have been continuously told that everybody knows the story about is that you have to fill in you have to fill it fill in something in order to make it like a feature and stuff like that and there's no better way there's no better way that you can fill fill in the gap than with the zany muppet antics the humor the char- like the characters and all that stuff like it, it, it just made it, it just makes sense it's like it's the muppets working on something like that and the best part is, is that this actually goes with what I said in the Great Muppet Caper, how they they were introduced as actors. Like many times, you don't really believe that these are actually the Muppets. Like they're it's that it's Kermit, it's Fozzie, or it's Miss Piggy, or whatever. A lot of times, you do believe that they are the characters that they are playing. Like there are many times when you look at. Um, in Muppets Christmas Carol, you don't really believe that's Kermit. Often you see him as Bob Cratchit. And like Ro- and even Robin, that's like that's Tiny Tim. Like sure like sure, like not all the all the characters are like that. You don't really see Charles Dickens and Gonzo and Rizzo, you just see Gonzo and Rizzo. But still, like it's not really that big of an issue. Plus the fact plus another thing I want to, I want to mention is the fact that often they the char- some of the more main characters are not really the muppets they're often played by actors or they're new muppets like in um, how the muppets christmas carol none of the original muppets played any of the ghosts they're all original mm-hmm. they're all original ones it's the ghost of christmas past ghost of christmas present and ghost of christmas future often it knows when to have the zany muppet muppet antics and it knows when to actually be serious with the story. Didn't they? Uh, didn't they? Uh, at one point, I think Morgan, you were you were telling me this once upon a time when we watched the movie together. Um, uh, they at one point uh, floated the idea of having different Muppets at, as different ghosts. Yes, it is actually pretty pretty true i'm trying to remember exactly down the line who they had tagged um i believe if i remember correctly they had i think kermit doing christmas past or it might have been someone else but i know for sure they did have miss piggy as christmas present 
And what they were going to do originally for Christmas Future is that it would be Gonzo, but he wouldn't talk. He would just see his nose coming out of the hood. And no fun. When, and what happened was um, Jerry Jewell wrote this idea of, or I think no, I think it was Brian Froud that, or, or someone, one of the illustrators who did Muppet Designs, I think it might have been Michael Firth, if I'm not mistaken. If I'm wrong, I apologize. Um, did this sketch of Gonzo as Charles Dickens, and then that's when they realized that they had a much more better idea, and they had instead the Muppet characters cast as the main characters instead of the ghosts. And I think at one point they were going to have Scrooge be this giant um, human Muppet, but it didn't work for some reason, I guess. That was later when they were planning it out. Um, but the way they do Christmas Carol, it's pretty much a basic, straightforward adaptation, but it really hangs on to the heart and soul of it. It's one of my favorite adaptations. I, you know, it really follows the spirit of Charles Dickens' work, especially when they have Gonzo in their narrating and being used as um, the book source. He's mm -hmm. legitimately reading passages from the book. And you know, when they had the idea of him being in as a narrator, it's like, okay, now we have a really good way of having all the imagery that Charles wrote in his novel, it's being told down. So that way kids can have you know, their cake and eat it too. They have the words of the actual source being told while they're seeing portrayed in a Muppet way. And it works. It really works. You have this very nice, beautiful um, narration, you know, depicting the imagery of what's going on, and it completely complements that. Mm-hmm. Well, let me just say, my God, Robin as Tiny Tim. <laughs> seeing it now, I have never cried so so much. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Oh. Uh, they. You you see that's why that's what makes the story work. And even even then even even now and then hindsight you know because uh, Jerry Nelson God rest his soul he's no longer with us but. But then, then it was a tough idea. Then it was a tough moment to take. And and uh, that's that's why I, I always I always say uh, tiny tiny Tim is a, a an element in there that's not to be messed with. No, not to be tweaked. Oh, yeah. Oh god, I'm I'm literally legitimately watering up as we speak. I'm not even kidding. Indeed. Oh, oh my god, dude, really? <laughs> I tell you, Jerry Nelson had a pretty wow. big impact. Okay. Treasure Island. Uh, so All right. <laughs> as so as Christmas Carol was to the Muppets movie, I think what they tried to do with Treasure Island was make it just like how Caper was, being sany, goofy, really out there. And keep in mind, it's been a while since I've seen the movie, and I think it might have been my first moment movie I saw in theaters. I'm not 100% sure, but just throwing it out there. And my basic memory is that I do remember some pretty good jokes. I mean, Tim Curry being the biggest one. But every mm -hmm. time I always think of the movie as a whole... Eh, I mean, I like the idea they're trying to do something different, even if it's uh, a franchise you could just scoff at and say, Ha! Oh, pirates! Cutthroat Island destroyed them years ago! <laughs> um, actually, a year ago, per se. But, um, the yeah. ambition's there, there's a lot of fun, and I think it's more of an attempt again to try to do the comedy that they did um, once before and it doesn't fail there's times where it works and times where it just falls flat but I don't know I mean I, I might have to revisit that one it's not bad it's just one of those films where it's like you think back to it and only a few things come to mind especially considering how Jim Hawkins has a very high-pitched voice shall we say bigger 
More than mine? Enough with the singing! (laughs) No, but it does bring out an interesting point. I mean, one of the biggest reasons how the Muppets Christmas Carol is much more beloved than Muppets Treasure Island is all is the way that how it's related to Christmas. It, it has, you know, like it mostly it has that charm and it has, has that, you know, heartwarming Christmas feeling that makes it timeless. And well, like I said, it, it, it has that charm. Muppets Treasure Island like it has the zaniness of the Muppet. It has the zany Muppet moments. Mm. Like it does try to try to explain like what the book is like yeah it were it can work but it doesn't really have that charm yeah per se like i'm not saying it's supposed to have like i'm not saying muppets treasure island should have christmas charm but i mean it, it it doesn't really have like the charm like the heartfelt moments i, I see what you mean by that actually it's really where you really do care about the characters. Yeah, yeah, it's really banking more on the comedy, as I said earlier. You have that scene where Gonzo's like, "We're going to be rich," and he has the dollar signs in his eyes, and Rizzo, "We're going to be dead," and there's the crossbones. And it's obvious they're really easily going for comedy here. Mm-hmm. They're just doing one joke after a minute. The fourth wall bits. I think there's a sequence where a bunch of rats come in with a TV monitor saying that they're making the movie or something like that. It's weird. Um. The only heart I can think of is Tim Curry, but he's supposed to be the villain, and there really isn't too much of heart. There's like three scenes he shares with Jim that are actually pretty effective, and that's about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At least Mr. Arrow survives. This very, very safe, cautiously created boat, crafted from the greatest safety precautions. The way I see it, it's a good movie to quote, but it's one of those films where it's like, uh, maybe if there's nothing else on, I yeah, will give I, this a shot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I, uh, it, uh, I, I do want to mention really quick. I give it three flying Kermits you... into a gong out of four. <laughs> Good grief. Full oh, girlfriend. <laughs> nice. Oh, girlfriend. <laughs> It's the movie you love to quote, but you don't know if you're gonna watch it. <laughs> exactly. Um, this just—I got a random tidbit. Mm. Well, I got trivia for you. For mm. one Ooh, mm. you got so trivia. You, you got Muppet trivia. Ooh, work, 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 work. <laughs> so, did you know that there was a lawsuit attached to this? Yep. I Ooh. did not. Lawsuit. Mm-hmm. The, Against the lawsuit of Muppet Treasure Island. Take it away, was, Mike. Uh, Hormel Foods, who were the creator of Spam, uh, sued Jim Henson Productions for using the word name Spam for one of the uh, tribal pig characters. It's like you can't use our name. You cannot use our name. It's Spam. And then. The court case was dismissed because uh, one might think Hormel would welcome the association with a genuine source of pork. Uh, <laughs> okay, that is a bit of a stupid. That, that is a bit of a stupid court case. I mean, like, it's just a freaking name. I mean, like, if I, if I, if <laughs> like. If I create like a we, if I create like a pig character and I name it Xbox, I'm not gonna see freaking Microsoft gonna come at me and try to sue me. Hmm. You can't say Xbox in the in the podcast. We will say bleep instead. It's, you no, you know what actually? You know what this actually sounds like? Huh? This actually sounds like when Candy Crush. When, yeah, the, the company that, that made Candy Crush Saga tried to copyright the word candy. Stupid. That's exactly what it sounds like. So we can't say Candyland anymore. We'll just call it Sweetie Cavity Teeny Tighty Beatsy Bitesy in stuff you can find in the cupboard along with a huge bag of sugar land. With extra we'll just, molasses swamp. We'll so, just call uh, yeah. it Diabetes. Yeah, so, but the... Yay! Yeah. And... But here's the 
here's the kicker about it. Uh, the character of the Trilo Pig Spam was a racing boss in Muppet Race Mania, and he was credited as Pig Chief. So they're like, okay, we'll just change the name to Pig Chief in the game instead of Spam. It's like oh, how... Yeah. Uh, it's like... Uh, it, it's like how the uh, the Disney company uh, refuses to use the... Um, uh, the likeness of Louis Prima since Tailspin. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> technically... Oh, yeah, that is true. Although, Tailspin is a weird, weird concoction to begin with. And I like it. I'm not saying... It's, it I'm not saying it's bad. <laughs> it's just, how in the fridge do you go from classic Rudyard Kipling characters to... Having them fly on a plane, dude. In World War Two, dude, 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 dude. It has dude, Ricky air Ric- pirates, dude, dude, dude. It has Ricky Ricardo as the leader of a bunch of air pirates. What is there not to complain about? Exactly, exactly. I'm not complaining. I'm just awesome. asking. Except... I know, I know. Don't worry. I lo- I like. But, um... I used to watch Tailspin as a kid. I like Tailspin. I just want to know how the fridge did you go from point A to point W? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Anyways, um, so the Muppet Muppet Treasure Island. It's the Cloud was Atlas effect. on February sixteenth, nineteen ninety six, and it was a month before uh, Muppets Tonight aired on ABC in March. Ah, yes. Muppets Tonight. Creepy Clifford. Yes, You didn't like yes. Clifford? Uh, no, that's James. You didn't like Clifford? <laughs> what did Clifford have to you? <laughs> Clifford was no so, Kermit, I'll give it that, but at least he tried. Um, the, the, the issue I had... Two, the next film... <laughs> Can I, I, was, I was just, uh... I was just summoned yeah. here. So, and I the next say film, my piece. Just... <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, the, so, the, the problem I had with Clifford in the in Muppets Tonight was was uh, I watched one episode of it and I I didn't think he was as good of a host as as Kermit and that was all. But the whole time I was thinking something's missing, something's missing. Oh yeah, his glasses. Because I had grown up seeing him with nothing but glasses from oh, the, yeah. the Jim Actually, Henson hour. That is true, that is true. same yeah. here. You yeah. know, oddly enough, when I was growing up with the Muppets, I always thought Clifford was always like was like the new member of the Electric Mayhem for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> I always thought it was a fish. <laughs> Thanks for listening to part one of Cinema Royale's retrospective of the Muppet film franchise. It had to be split into two parts because this is honestly the longest Cinema Royale episode we ever recorded. I mean, all together, part one and two, it's actually over three hours long. And we figure, I figure, you guys should listen in, into two parts. Uh, the second part... Uh, you can click on right now on the screen. It's a big neon sign that says click here. In part two, you'll hear about our opinions on Muppets from Space until the current Muppet films. And I think you'll like it just as much as this part. So thanks for listening again. And uh, make sure you subscribe for more Sim Royal episodes and other random videos by me, Mike Mixtape. Bye.